Praise the Lord, and we are gathered together around the Word of God again today, amen. Well, for those of you who are in Manitoba, I guess we're in for a heat wave today, but uh, it's going to be warm, but it hopefully not only will it be warm on the outside, but it will be warm on the inside with our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. And I hope that you're going to have some fellowship someplace and be able to encourage one another in the Word of God. Welcome to another Discipleship Empowerment Word. And we're on a journey of looking at the whole idea of holiness and how our God is the Holy One and uh, how He desires that we walk in His presence, in His holiness. And so we've been walking through the book of Isaiah and uh, looking at various things concerning this whole area of holiness. And it's interesting that just a little bit in the end of the Psalms, we have the title Holy One that is mentioned to us. And we know that title Holy One, and we've been talking about it the last couple of days. But it's unique that as we move on into Isaiah, what gets attached to this word holy? That's the thing that I, I, I always want to say, what's going on around the word? What, what is taking place? Sometimes you have to look up a verse a little higher up and sometimes a little below or to one side or to the other but to take a word and just see what's going on around it to get a little bit deeper vision and sometimes you know it's not completely connected uh, in a direct way where it's you know has the idea of a holy hand or holy fellowship or all those things but it depends on what it's talking about uh, all around. And the reason why I say that, because today as we move into Isaiah, depending on how many verses we get through, but from Isaiah 41 uh, down for sure to Isaiah 48, the word that gets attached to the Holy One or is talked a lot about in connection with the Holy One is the word Redeemer. And depending on what Bible you have, what kind of a translation you have, uh, it will capitalize the word Redeemer, which is then a prophetic idea of not only who God is, but who the Messiah would be. A Redeemer, one who redeems back, who buys back, who brings back from death to life. And so I think it's beautiful today as of Sunday, a day of worship and praise, that we look at that the Holy One of Israel is a Redeemer. He redeems his people. He redeemed them from Egypt. He redeemed them from, from uh, I guess you could say, the wilderness. He redeemed them from in the promised land. And he continues to redeem us today as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when as we begin our little journey of looking at the word holy, we can see that the Holy One is a Redeemer. Or maybe we can even attach it this way, how we can have holy redemption. Now, there is an idea that maybe we haven't put together those two words before in the past, but that's kind of giving the impression that Isaiah wants us to see that the Holy One brings about holy redemption for us because that's what we need. We were lost in trespasses and sins. We would, we have fallen away from the Lord and disobedience and, and, uh, the only thing that would give us life eternal is redemption through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's what I think Isaiah begins to focus on. And not only that, remember Isaiah as a prophet. He's a one who is proclaiming what God lays on his heart to the people, to God's people. And I, 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 I know I will say that every day, and I may say it a thousand times yet more before we're finished, that most of the scriptures are written to God's people to bring about a change in God's people, to take God's people and draw them to the heart of God himself so that God's people can walk in God, can walk in God's holiness. And so I always want to reflect on that because so often we think of, uh, well, that's good for those. That's good for our neighbor or that's good for our lost country or that's good for the heathen on the street. We wish they would all get out. But I want you to realize these books 
especially in the Hebrew scriptures, were written for the Hebrew people, the people of Israel. That's why he could use this term, Holy One of Israel. And in the New Testament, uh, that after Jesus had gone and, and died on the cross and and resurrected from the church, from the dead, his church was birthed forth on the day of Pentecost when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the people and began to unify them and bring them together around the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, around the redemptive power that came through the blood of Jesus Christ. And after that point, almost all the scriptures are doing what? They're teaching people in the body of Christ how to be more like a body. <laughs> you know what I mean? So whether we like it or not, every day when we do discipleship empowerment word, I mean, I thank God for the whole, those who are outsiders who are watching and those who are wondering what's going on. But in reality, when we do these word studies, they're there to help us as disciples grow closer to our faith and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so let's not just always be thinking about the others, but let's think about when we're standing, you know, in front of the mirror, you know, when we're journeying through. And so here, as we go into Psalm 41, we are Psalm 41, Isaiah 41, that we would look at verse 14 and notice what it says. It's unique what it says here. It says, Fear not, you worm of Jacob. <laughs> and I, I, I know that's probably not a very good, good description of what Jacob is. But, you know, Jacob, you know, felt unworthy and was a deceiver and all those kinds of things. And he's saying, fear not, O worm of Jacob, you men of Israel. Now, see, so he's talking about the men of Jacob. Why would he say that? Well, out of Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel. And so he says, you men of Jacob, you, you, you men of Israel, this is what I want you to hear today, he says. This is what you need, because in Isaiah's time, he is talking about the people of Israel, the 12 tribes. Some have already been scattered, some have already been broken away, but they're still part of Israel. And even today, the 12 tribes are being uh, moved by the power of God to come back to Israel from every nation and, and from every direction they're going to come back. And here he is again pointing to the 12 tribes of Israel and saying, hey, I've got something you need to understand. He says, I want to tell you, you 12 tribes, I want to tell you, you people of Israel, that not only am I the Holy One, which he's going to say here, but he's going to say, I am also the Redeemer. You think it's impossible to redeem, redeem back. See, a lot of people think, well, we've fallen away so far that there is no way of getting redemption back. You know, I'm really praying. I've been in this community where I live now since 1980, and I have seen a lot of people fall away. In fact, we could, we could probably build a church of thousands just in the people who have fallen away. But if you happen to be one of those ones that have fallen away, let me tell you, the Holy One of Israel is also the Holy One who redeems and has sent forth His Son as a Redeemer. Amen? And so he goes on here, Fear not, you worm of Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. There it is, all together in one statement. I am the Holy One of Israel who will redeem you, who will buy you back, who will lay down his life for you. He says, Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharper teeth and will make a thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. And he's saying, I, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use you to bring about a harvest. Bring about something that is going to bring honor and glory to the Lord. So we start on our journey, as we said already, that we're talking about how the Holy One is the Redeemer. Then we go over into 4120. It doesn't use the word Redeemer here, but it does say something here in verse 20 that they may see and know and consider and understand together. Isn't that amazing? 
that they, talking about plurality, a number of people, or talking about Israel as a whole, or maybe even today as a church, that they, okay, may see, so that we may see what God is doing around us, that we not only see it, but we know it, and we understand it. And he goes on, so that they may see, know, and consider, and understand together. So they were meeting together, they were talking about and say, okay, as as the script the New Testament says, what can we do to stir up each other together? How can we serve together? You know, there is a great need for togetherness. I thank God that over the last year I've seen a coming together of the body of Christ. As we've worked on David's song, you know, we've seen the coming together of not only the writing of it, but also the artist the people, the layout people, the printing people. Then you have, of course, the need for finances. People are blessed with finances to give. And then you have the, the after they've been printed and put together, the need for people to go and hand them out and to use them as an evangelistic tool. And, and what I've seen is a great move of the body working together. Boy, when a body works together, it accomplishes a lot of things. And so a lot of times when I'm praying in the morning, I'm saying, Oh God, raise up the body to work together. Raise up those ones who can give financially. Raise up those ones who can go out and, and give it away and be evangelists. Raise up those ones with certain giftings so they can communicate with other people. Raise up those ones who can out lay things out. You know, because that's all we need. We can't be all things ourselves. We need the body. And that's why he's saying, and to consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and that the Holy One of Israel has created it. So God is our creator who creates everything, who brings us all together. And he does it so that he may be glorified. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? Well, then as we go over into 43, we see uh, a, another large passage of scripture that I would like to go back and preach on, but we won't have the time today. But in 43, it talks about uh, this whole idea, how God is going to redeem Israel. God is a God who redeems. Don't give up on those that have fallen away. Don't give up on those children or grandchildren or whoever may have fallen away because it's God, the Holy One of Israel, who does the redemptive work. We are vessels. We might water. We might plant seed and all those kinds of other things, but it's body ministry doing it together that is going to bring about some redemptive work that we never thought was possible. You know, I have seen people who are so far away, people in prison, people you never thought that God could reach down into that hard, rocky soil or that hard pathway and, and, and begin to break it out so that his redemptive power can begin to change their lives. Look what he says here. And he uses this whole idea of water. And But we're going to go at verse 3 of chapter 43. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I'm going to save you and redeem you. I am the Holy One of Israel. And I think, you know, some of us are praying for family members and that. We need to come before the Lord as the Holy One of Israel and say, Lord, you're the Holy One. You're the Redeemer. And I know you can redeem and you can save. And Lord, I know that you have a complete plan for all of us. And Lord, that you're working out your will in our lives, in the lives of the wolves around about us, that you got something going on and that the end result is going to be greater than what we could ever have thought. Praise God. Amen. He says, I am the Lord, your God. Get that. Oh, we got to get that. You know, it's so easy to forget. We forget, we forget, we forget that God is the great I am, the Lord, your God. Whatever you need from Alpha to the Omega, from the beginning to the end, whatever is needed in between, I am. I am your Savior. I am the Holy One of Israel. I gave Egypt as your ransom. And he talks about 
how they paid for what was going on. But then, as he continues on talking about this whole area of redeeming and bringing them out, this is where we need to, I think today, this if this is a discipleship that we really need to get a hold of, a discipleship point, is that first, he's holy, and second of all, he's redeemer, who will bring about salvation? Well, I guess that's three, right? <laughs> but look what it says in verse 14. He says, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. Here it is. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. And this is where Isaiah is just starting to introduce this idea of redemption. Why is he introducing? Because the people of God are so far away from God, <laughs> they're falling off a cliff. And Isaiah could have just said, Lord, just pull the plug and forget about us as a people and let it all be done. But that's not our God. That's not the Holy One of Israel. That's not, you know, we may give up on other people. We may give up and say there is no, there is no chance that, that it's not going to change. You know, is let me tell you, Isaiah was saying, God, you are the Holy One. You are the Redeemer. And I know you will redeem your people. And I think about these people are the ones who had walked with the Lord. You know, we know a lot of people that have walked with the Lord, filled with the Spirit, you know, been Sunday school teachers, worship leaders, you know, elders or deacons in the church that are not walking with the Lord right now. And we say, what happened? What's going on? Let me tell you what's going on. The Holy One of Israel has got a plan and his plan is redemption. Can you say amen to that? Because look what he says here, verse 14. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. There it is again, attached together. There it is. He's trying to say, get this. I am the Holy One, but as your Holy One, I am your Redeemer. And not only your Redeemer, I am the redeeming one who is going to redeem others. And this word Redeemer is capitalized, which is referring to the Messiah, which is referring to the Anointed One who has the power and the authority to redeem. Now there's an amazing thought. We want to just give up, but don't give up. Just keep praying. Keep talking to the Holy One and say, Lord, one of your names is Redeemer. And Lord, and his redeeming is to buy back that which has been lost. So he goes on. For your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives. He's talking about, you know, that because of what they've done in that, they're going to go through hard times. They're going to go through challenges. I'm actually going to destroy everything. And I'm going to allow them to be hauled away as fugitives. To Babylon. That's where we end up with Daniel and all the other stories. And then we get Ezra and, and Nehemiah coming back. It says they're going to go to the fugitives, the, Chalde the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. But then in verse 15, he says this again. He says, all the enemy is rejoicing. They're bragging about, look at how many ships we got. Look how big our army is. Look how we're going to de defeat Israel, you know. The beautiful city of Jerusalem, we're going to destroy it. You know, we're going to tear down your God. And they're going to brag about it. But look what verse 15 says. He says, I am the Lord. Here he is again. I am that I am. Remember what he told Moses? Tell the people that I am who I am. Tell them that I am who I am will deliver them. Tell them that I am who I am has heard their prayers. Tell them that the I am that I am is their God, the Holy One. And so the I am the Lord, your Holy One. Your Holy One. And I think I got to get that. He's my Holy One. I got to quit looking around all over the place and get to the place of realizing he's our Holy One. He's my Holy One. He is my Redeemer. And rejoice in that. Amen. Praise God. Because look at he says, I am the Lord your God. And now here comes something very powerful. The creator of Israel, your king. Uh-oh. Now they need to go back and say, 
creator of Israel. Yeah. I called out Abraham. And out of Abraham, I raised up a miracle of Isaac. And out of Isaac, I performed another miracle and birthed forth Jacob, who became the father of 12 tribes of Israel. And all through that, God is saying, I have kept my covenants. I have kept my holy promises. I have kept it all. And the reason you are who you are, because I am the Holy One of Israel, and I have created everything. And not only have I created, but praise God, I am also king of. And they needed to get this understanding because, you know, they were always complaining. We want a king like every other nation. You know, and God finally says, sure, I'll give you a king. Then here you can have Saul. And Saul got him in the trouble. But praise the Lord that the next one who came along, the anointing, came on David. And of course, he was out of the root of Jesse. And we know out of the root of Jesse would come the Messiah, and David would be king, and Saul would be king, and then there was other great kings, but there was a lot of wayward and, and disobedient and, and uh, uh, sinful kings. But God is reminding them that I am your creator of Israel, your king. You know, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess one day. That he is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. Isn't that exciting? So here, what a, what a build up we're getting here in these two verses. We're seeing, he's trying to get us to picture the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The Holy One of Israel is your creator. And the Holy One of Israel is your king. I don't know what greater titles we can we can get a hold of than that, but that's powerful. That is so powerful. Then, but he doesn't stop there. Let's go over as we continue on, uh, seeing about the holiness of God as we look in chapter forty-five. In chapter forty-five, it begins to bring together how how God is going to you know still reign forth his righteousness. And in verse 11, he, he, said, he makes it even more personal. He says, thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And what does he say again? The Holy One of Israel and his maker. Wow. And maker is capitalized here too. He has made us. He has created us. He has breathed life into us. Oh, so much we could say there. And he goes on, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. And it goes on and talks about his hands and how his hands are stretched forth from heaven and how he, the Holy One, is going to minister to the people. Verse 13, I have raised him up in righteousness. Oh, God is doing powerful things and continues to do powerful things. We get over into 48, where he talks about the holy city. 48, verse 1, he talks about Jacob, and he says, and how they had committed to his name, and how Israel was their maker and God, and how he put, but not in truth, but or in righteousness, how they were stopping not to walk in truth and righteousness. And then we continue on, where we want to get over to uh Isaiah 48, 17, and where I think it's it's important that we grab a hold of this, because in Isaiah 48, 17, he says, and again, look how he piles the, the I don't know if the words adjectives or descriptive words with this whole concept of Holy One. He says, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. Here it is again, your Redeemer. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is what the Christ, the Messiah, is saying to you, O Holy One of Israel. There it is. Redeemer, Holy One of Israel. What should we see again? I am the Lord. Do you think Isaiah is trying to get something across to the people here? Hey, people of Israel, our Holy One is a Redeemer. Our Holy One is a Savior. Our Holy One is our Teacher. He is the one who is going to lead us. He goes on, I am the Holy One of Israel. I am your, 
I, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way that you should go. He is the Holy One. And our last two verses that we want to just focus on today comes from Isaiah chapter 49. Are you getting it yet? Do you think Isaiah is trying to get something across here from chapter 41 to chapter 49? Do you think he's trying to build up a case here that Israel, your God is your creator. He has made you. He's birthed you forth. He has done marvelous things in your midst. He's brought forth signs and wonders as the Bible talks about. And he says, and he is the Holy One. Now bow down before him, worship him, return back to him because he is your redeemer and your savior. What an amazing thought. 49 verse 7. Just in case we didn't get it, <laughs> he's going to go at it again. He says, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. Remember, Isaiah is prophesying. He's not speaking his words. He's speaking the words right from the very throne room of God. From the holy throne, from the holy heavens, from the holy God. This word is coming forth to the prophet Isaiah, to the people of Israel, to God's people. This is what he's saying. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. Here it is again. The Redeemer of Israel. Their, their Holy One. Now here's a little bit of a shift. Because we often saw the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer or Holy One of Israel. But notice what's tucked in here, just quietly. Their Holy One. Seems to me that's something that we need to get to the place too. That's where people fall away. That's where people fall down. That's where people make the mistake. They have stopped having God, the Holy One, their God their Redeemer, their Savior. You know, your friends are not your Redeemer. Your children are not your Redeemer. Your family is not your Redeemer or Savior. None of them can do it. Your church can't do it. Where you gather together, they can't do it. But who can do it? The Holy One of Israel, who is their Holy One. That's the key. People ask me, why do we need to make a personal commitment to Jesus Christ? I'll tell you, because he needs to be your God. You don't worship him as someone else's God and you are just on the coattails. You are in his presence and he is your God, your Holy One, your Savior, your Redeemer, your Merciful One. I mean, we could just go on and on and on. He says, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him who the nations abhor, the servants and rulers, kings and shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. This is what we're going to end on today. I want us to realize the Holy One of Israel is to be our God and that we're to walk in Him, we're to focus on Him and to remember one of the greatest miracles that God has done for all of you who are watching right now. I know who you are. I can see you. Thank you for waving. But He chose you. He chose you. So it says here, the Holy One of Israel and He has chosen he has chosen. He has chosen the Messiah who is going to lead you out as a redeemer. And he has chosen you so that you could be redeemed and have eternal life through faith in him. Isn't that amazing? Wow, there's so much to learn here. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are to make you our Holy One. No other, no other thing, no other possession, no other people, but you, O oh Lord. And as we make you, O oh God, through faith and believing as our Holy One, Lord, you will pour forth your redemption and your salvation and you will redeem us and you will empower us. You will fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, it's amazing what you will do with your people. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for bringing us close to your heart. And I pray today that 
you may just continue to be glorified in all that we say and do. And Lord, that we will confess, that we will confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Holy One who brings about redemption and salvation to all, to all who will believe. And we give you thanks now in your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. For those of you who have never invited Christ into your heart, I just want to tell you today, just call upon him. Just call upon the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. And you know what? As you pray and ask him to forgive you of your sin, he will redeem you and bring forth salvation so that you may begin to have a personal journey with him and not only have a personal journey with him, but become his disciple where you follow him and grow and mature in him. Amen. I just want to encourage those who are around about, if you got no place to fellowship today, we are going to be in St. Anne at the church there with Pastor Earl Taves. And it's an outdoor service. You just come up with your car and your lawn chairs. And today you may bring a hat and an umbrella because it could be hot. But it starts at 10 o'clock in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm not sure when the last time was I did a parking lot service. I've done beach services. I've done all kinds of other things. But I don't know if I've ever done a drive-in service. But I'm looking forward to gathering with the church there in St. Anne with the wonderful people there. And if you got no place to fellowship, I encourage you. You don't have to do much. Just get in your car and come and park on the parking lot and we'll wave at you and everything else. We'll just show you the love of God. Amen. So God bless you. Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow and keep on keeping on in Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye. We love you now.